Oh, hi, weirdos. Dan Rossbach here, your lead discussant at the Weird Book Book Club. I was just going over some of the latest submissions here for the WBBC advice column, and I found a letter that's come all the way from Sweden. Exciting, right? Let's see what they have to say. Dear Dan, I am a member of the selection committee for a very prestigious literary prize, and I found myself in quite a dilemma. While there are over a hundred living authors whose work might be said to merit this honor, never mind the international media attention and million dollar cash prize that comes along with it, many of my colleagues have singled out an individual who seems a problematic choice to say the least. The author, let's call him Pedro Mano Yave, has a history of publicly downplaying certain genocides, using his privileged position as an artist and intellectual to produce propaganda on behalf of authoritarian regimes, and generally paying his respects to war criminals. Should I go along with my colleague's recommendation, or should I suggest we invest our precious prize in a writer who definitely won't use it to glorify evil? Sincerely, Stumped in Stockholm. Well, Stumped, I have to say that that actually sounds like a pretty clear-cut choice. But just to be sure, let's use our time-tested method for flawless decision-making. Pick up the book you're reading, turn to a random page, and do whatever the first few sentences tell you. Here's the book we're reviewing today, Belladonna by Dasha Drindic, translated into English by Celia Hawksworth. Let's see what advice it has for us. Boop! Ooh, this is a good one, and quite pertinent to our topic. Here the narrator is thinking about all of the artists and intellectuals who, after the end of World War II, tried to justify their collaboration with the Nazi regime. Andreas Bond does not even wish to think about writers, about painters and actors, about singers and filmmakers who stay and serve. But Otto Klemperer leaves, Bruno Walter leaves, Fritz Busch, Arnold Schoenberg, and Alexander von Zemlinsky leave. Toscanini refuses to conduct in Nazi Germany, Oscar Dannen leaves to join the partisans, and when he mentions this to those acquaintances of his, they say, they were Jews or Serbs, they were saving their skins, as though those who stayed and served were not. Why does Fritz Wanger play for, for Hitler's birthday? Why does he play at Nazi rallies? Why does he shake Goebbels' hand after one of his concerts? Why is his recording of Bruckner's Seventh Symphony broadcast immediately after Hitler's death? Had the Nazis by any chance won the war, would Fritz Wangler have taken shelter in a more secure place? Would he have withdrawn his anti-Semitic pronouncements? It is a dubious, rickety justification that would suggest anyone is indebted to these artistic giants, who are also human monsters, dwarfs. Well, there you have it. Why waste a single breath ennobling the legacy of a nationalist nutjob who's only going to use his platform to continue spewing rhetorical slime? Not worth publicly commending, and definitely not worth a fancy gold medal. Let his artistic works speak for themselves, and his political acts be condemned with every ounce of moral conviction that we possess. Whew. Well, that was a close one. Although it really, really shouldn't have been. Oh, look, there's a postscript here. Please send your reply by October 9th. It's kind of important. Well, this letter is dated two months ago. Why did my secretaries just put it on my desk today? I know, let's give them a call. Well, I suppose as the leader of the WBBC, I also bear some responsibility for this atrocity. No, no one ever needs to know. We'll just start over like, like it never happened. Oh, hi, weirdos. Have you ever read a book that made you very, very angry in a good way? It can be pretty cathartic in these troubled political times. Like, hell yeah, this author is going there. Shit is fucked up and they are tired of trying to make us feel good about it. We need to get mad, we need to do something. Ah! Well then, I've got great news for you. Because while many authors claim to give no fucks, Dasha Drindic has actually achieved absolute fucking zero. Did you sell out all your moral convictions to collaborate with fascists? <laughs> Do you spend your time trying to make war criminals seem like not such bad people? If you can make it through Belladonna without immediately wanting to walk out your front door and punch a Nazi in the face, well, you're even more dead inside than I am. And if you're like me and you feel like you really ought to be better informed about the brutal legacies of fascism and nationalism and all those other sinister political ideologies that are currently gaining momentum across the globe, Drindic is ready to serve you up the cold, brutal facts, complete with fields full of dismembered dolls and 12 entire pages dedicated to listing the names of a group of refugees who briefly escaped the sphere of Nazi influence only to be deported back to the 
concentration camps that they had thought they had escaped. It's so bizarre to me personally to have seen this massive cultural shift where growing up it always felt like when Nazis were depicted in popular media or the news it was never in an attempt to sympathize with them or understand their point of view. Whereas now in our current political moment, in fact in the very year that Belladonna was published in English, we see a president who insists that they really deserve to have a public platform. And we should all really try to understand where they're coming from. To which I say, <laughs> and to which Drindich more thoughtfully and artistically applies her very deep understanding of history. Born in what is now Croatia about a year after the end of World War II, Drindich and her protagonist in Belladonna both display an almost encyclopedic knowledge of the atrocities committed by the Nazis and their collaborators in the various fascist puppet states that were set up throughout the former Yugoslavian Republic. This does not necessarily make them very popular. Our protagonist, Andreas Bonn, is an elderly ailing psychologist in the process of basically closing up shop on life. In addition to his mounting physical ailments and dwindling job prospects, his countrymen clearly don't appreciate the knowledge that he has to offer. Having this walking, talking catalog of all of Croatia's political sins in the room with you is kind of inconvenient when you'd rather tell a different historical narrative. Where, yeah, your most prominent political and intellectual leaders did technically collaborate with Nazis, but they weren't all such bad guys, really. There's this fantastically tense scene where Andreas is attending an academic conference, the theme of which is intellectuals in wartime. And instead of having an honest discussion about how artists, professors, editors, curators failed to mount a resistance to their fascist occupiers, and in fact displayed an overwhelming willingness to take up privileged positions within the puppet state that would allow them to keep pursuing their own creative interests. Well, the academics at this conference think it would make a more inspiring story to paint them more as silent subversives who only appeared to be capitulating to the will of a genocidal regime. At that scholarly conference about intellectuals in the war, at which there was no audience, at which the audience consisted of those who had come with their little papers and little stories to convince one another that everything was now clear, that the past had no connection with the present. Instead of social sciences students attending the conference about intellectuals in the war, another participant rambled on for 20 minutes about the tragic destiny of Milovoj Magdic, who, as editor of the Ustasha journal Sprenmost, Readiness, smuggled in subversive articles about the writing of Thomas Mann, Edgar Allan Poe and the Surrealists, so shattering the poetics of the native soil and the hearth, and in fact opening free space. That is what he said, free space and the monstrous NDH, cracks through which to glimpse different kinds of landscape. Because in that Ustasha Spremnost, they published also humorous writings, novellas and articles by Mayakovsky, Zolchenko, and Babel, Russian avant-garde writers, in other words. This historical researcher maintained, under the aegis of dispassionate analysis of the Ustasha movement, which in Andreas Bond's eyes does not bear relativizing, just as Nazism does not. There are no minor Ustashas. There are no minor Nazis. But as cathartic as it often feels to have these epic confrontations with ignorance, to overwhelm it even with a sheer volume of facts, the overall tone of Belladonna is far from triumphant. As much as it feels morally and historically important that we carry an awareness of mankind's worst acts, that we don't allow their victims to be erased from our collective memory, that's not an easy burden to carry. It's fucking sad for one thing, and a bit scary in a way to think that at any point during your day where you're just trying to live your one life and experience new things, you might have these memories of past tragedy suddenly wash over you and completely consume your consciousness. This is something that's happening constantly to our protagonist, Andreas Bonn. And I think it happens most powerfully when he's enjoying some much-needed travel in the Netherlands and touring The Hague with a friend. And as they stroll past a public park, this friend calls his attention to what looks like a set of sculptures. Very innocuous seeming, almost like a cross between a cartoonishly large chair and a twisted set of monkey bars. But looking more closely, you can see that etched in each one of those cross beams are the names of more than 2,000 children who were rounded up in that very spot and sent off to concentration camps. Some of these kids were as young as six months. Some of the surnames on the list appear so often it slowly dawns on you that an entire generation of an extended family is being wiped out all at once. In Belladonna, it seems like all attempts to suppress an awareness of the tragedies that have actually formed the foundation for our present moment, those sort of self-defensive mental cover-ups are 
always doomed to fail. Even when these memories are partitioned off in the depths of our subconscious, they'll find some means to manifest themselves. If not in the mind, then in the body. Throughout the novel, our protagonist, Andreas Bonn, is described as a person in the process of basically shutting down. He's a psychologist who doesn't psychologize anymore, a professor on the verge of a forced retirement, a man who knows for a fact that all his life's work of historical reclamation will not be valued by future generations, who'd rather remain ignorant of their ancestors' hideous acts. But as he himself resolves to stop giving a shit, his body seems to follow suit. He's diagnosed with breast cancer and, forgive my use of medical jargon here, a disintegrating spine. And despite a plummeting quality of life, with no hope of complete recovery, this disease seems to reactivate in him a will to survive, to pursue treatment, and so to go on living and remembering. There are plenty of similar examples throughout the novel where suppressed traumas resurface as bodily malfunctions. The psychological profile of one Croatian man, a successful anesthesiologist named Rudolf Sass, particularly stood out to me partially because his seeking treatment was prompted by an inexplicably and chronically itchy butthole. And so, starting from that butthole, we trace his history back to his teenage years in Belgrade his Jewish friends who were all rounded up and suddenly made to disappear, and his father who collaborated with the Nazi regime who murdered them. And finally, we see his failure to reckon with the full, monstrous nature of what had happened, his failure to hold his family accountable just sitting in his gut. Drindic takes this concept of repressed trauma returning as physical malfunction even further by collaging in these odd little fragments of scientific studies and news reports where animals held in isolation suddenly begin to start inflicting harm upon themselves or just mysteriously die off. Even bestial bodies can't help but betray their sense of loss. But what, you may ask, is the point of all this excavation of suffering, of pulling together all these vignettes and historical incidents to create such a mosaic of misery? And what kind of sick fuck would actually enjoy reading it? Well, the answer to the last question is obviously me. As for the former, here's my guess. Drindic is suggesting that to be an author worth reading, to be a social critic worth listening to, or just to be a plain old human being with any sense of moral responsibility, you're stuck from the start between two undesirable options. Honestly and openly engage with the darkest episodes of our past, which nobody honestly wants to hear about, and because they make us, humanity, look like terrible monster spawn. Or you can focus all your efforts on trying to bury these truths beneath pleasant thoughts and false optimism, only to have them tear us open from the inside like that baby xenomorph from Aliens. So why is it better to live beside our filth, having it out in the open, wallowing in it even, rather than trying to keep it bottled up inside us? In an interview she did with the Paris Review, Drindic said, Art cannot change the world, but it can change us. Art can and may aestheticize, but I do not think that this is its only function. Le belles lettres is a heavily outdated term, therefore today a concept with hardly any weight. Art should shock, hurt, offend, intrigue, be a merciless critic of the merciless times we are not only witnessing, but whose victims we have become. In this domain, the so-called intellectuals have enormously failed by being silent, by committing treason. Good literature asks for a trauma, a personal, a collective, a historical trauma, no matter, and then the ability to formulate it. Good literature does not need a story. It is how events are presented that separate good literature from mediocre fictionalized writing, so often a boring linear construction. From what I've read of Drindic's public statements, it seems like she believed that this tearing open and exposure of our darkest filthiest historical slime is one of the most powerful and meaningful forms of human expression, period. And I would argue that Belladonna itself essentially proves her thesis statement. So many of the conventions of literature, a linear plot, a character or a set of characters who demonstrate moral growth or at least evolution, an ending which summarizes or at least begins to make sense of some of the intellectual chaos that the novel has stirred up along the way. All of those classic elements of literary fiction may actually be more pacifying than inspiring. Maybe we never needed them after all. Maybe it takes an artist who's ready to completely and savagely strip them away in order to show us what a raw, thrilling, and yes, politically engaging experience that literature can be. In another review of Drindic's work in the Paris Review, the critic Dustin Ellingsworth says, The highest distinction of pessimistic fiction is that it undermines its own project. 
as we do from the desolate, god-baiting novels of Hardy, the gaunt dramas of Beckett, or the post-national horror of late Bologna, we emerge from Vrindich's writing feeling both vanquished and invigorated. Such formidable intelligence and Homeric intention cannot help but thrill and exult. Vrindich ends her final novel with a quote from Kierkegaard, the philosopher of angst and despair. My misery is my castle, which is set, like an eagle's nest, among the clouds on top of the mountain. No one can conquer it. From it, I fly down into reality and snatch my prey. So for style, scope, and overall weirdness, I give Belladonna by Dasha Drindic five out of five morally conflicted assholes. I can understand why this book might not be everyone's cup of tea. It's one I definitely had to digest very slowly. If you're as ignorant of world history as I am, you're going to get a lot of references to political figures from the former Yugoslavian Republic that you probably have never heard of before, but who are very efficiently introduced in the copious footnotes throughout the book. It can be all over the place in terms of plot and perspective, a lot of collage and experimental elements that show up in one segment never to be seen again. Plus it's something of a hashtag mood read in that you're committing yourself to contemplating genocide for however long it takes you to consume a 375 page novel. But all of these challenges to my mind are what actually made it such a rewarding reading experience. And weirdly enough, for a novel that's supposedly about a guy who's contemplating suicide, there's actually a sequel to this, EEG, which I am very much looking forward to reading soon. Well, finally, that's all I have to talk about today. Have you read any novels by Dasha Drindic? If so, what'd you think about them? What are the most eye-opening, politically engaged novels you've ever read? Tell me all about them in the comments down below, or connect with me on social media. My accounts will be linked in the show notes. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you would like, share, or subscribe. More people in the world need to see me screaming in my basement, don't you think? Until next time, happy reading, weirdos. They told us we were girls, and we talked just look and cry! They told us we were girls!